All right, what else you got there, Russ? All right, this is from Daniel, another Patreon supporter. He says, I am persuaded that the last Ice Age ended with a comet strike, but I have a question I hope you can address in an upcoming video. Major glaciations have had a periodicity of roughly 100,000 years over the last million years. The ice appears to have melted over a 10,000-year span, followed by a 5 to 10,000 year of interglacial periods like our own, then another glaciation, repeating 10 times over the past million years. Has anyone calculated the amount of excess heat required to melt the ice in each one of these glaciations? So that's the first question he's got. Okay, and then what's his next question? The next says, was Earth in the midst of a melt cycle when the last strike occurred? And then he says, one of the critiques of the black ma black mat at the Younger Dryas boundary is that several black mats occur below the YD boundary at some sites. That could be ordinary forest fires, but that also suggests possibly earlier, lesser impacts. Is there any evidence of earlier or later impacts? Thanks. Okay, let's take Damn. those in reverse order. The black okay. mats are not exclusive, exclusively associated with the Younger Dryas boundary. That is correct. And they seem to be precipitated out or formed under conditions of moisture um, and the accumulation of, of organic material. Um, so that has been one of the criticisms is that the black mat cannot be exclusively associated with an impact. But there is a black mat layer that is associated with the impact. And that is the black mat layer that marks the um, period of megafaunal extinction, Clovis culture disappearance, and is marked by impact proxies at its base. Um, generally, most of the, I would say, uniformitarian explanations attributed to, to a rise in the water table. Now, I don't see that, that that necessarily is inconsistent with the idea that there would have been excessive rainfall associated with the onset of the Younger Dryas boundary, which would follow naturally, I think, from an impact into ice sheets. You would have, um, obviously, excessive rainfall. And when we get into this, as we're, we're moving towards that, but as we get into more detail, looking at the Younger Dryas, the, the melting of the great ice sheets, the extinctions, the... Uh, environmental consequences the, uh, the associated with those times, we're going to be looking at all of that. I mean, that's one of the main purposes of this series of podcasts that we're going to be doing. Uh, so at that point, yeah, we, we will address a lot of this in, in greater detail. But for now, the idea I think is, is that the black mats do seem to uh, form under uh, excessively moist conditions, perhaps uh, excessive rainfall, and we can't rule out the possibility that some of those black mat layers may be associated with other impacts, because I think there's evidence emerging now that there were, in fact, other episodes of, mel uh, of impacts clustered around the, the Younger Dryas boundary. Um, and earlier, um, even going back to 30 to 40,000 years. So that's a good question. And I'm very interested in exploring that further. As to the question, was the Earth in the midst of a melt cycle? Right. He wanted to know if it was already in a melt cycle when the... Apparently, Earth. I would say yes. Because uh, as I've, I've mentioned uh, several times in earlier uh, episodes, there appears to have been a melting event at 14,600 years ago, if that dating is in fact accurate. At 14,006, it appears that there was a melting episode, and then that was followed by a warming that could be explained by reference to the normal, the, the, the assumed factors, which is mostly Milankovitch factors, which is the or changing orbital geometries that can increase or diminish the amount of solar heat reaching the surface of the, of the Earth. So what you had was a protracted period of melting and a shrinking back of the ice sheets to perhaps 85 or 90 percent of their of the late glacial maximum extent. So, at the 12,900 boundary, yes, the the ice sheets had already begun to shrink back. Although the bulk of the ice still remained intact, they had shrunk back, and this allowed, for example, um, 
megafaunal to migrate into the recently vacated lands in the northern uh, United States and southern Canada. And it, this may be a period of time when the ice-free corridor opened up between the Cordilleran ice sheet over the Canadian Rockies and the Laurentide ice sheet centered on Hudson Bay. And that would have created the so-called ice-free corridor. Now, it's questionable whether during the Younger Dryas, there's some evidence to suggest re-expansion of glaciers. In other cases, it looks like the, the recession of the glaciers merely stopped. Uh, it may have not been uniformly a, a uniform effect over the whole ice mass, because you're talking about literally millions of square miles of area. And we're not going to necessarily be looking at a, a uniform response over an air, a geographical area so large. But apparently there was a, a warming that went back to about 14 and a half, 14, seven, right in there years before present. And ice began to shrink back. And then all of a sudden that was interrupted. It appears that that interruption was accompanied by mega scale meltwater, like we were just referring to the to the flood there at, at uh, Lake Nipigon, which we, we were just looking at the evidence for catastrophic outflow from the area of the Nipigon uh, Basin. And that flooding has been dated at 12,900, give or take a half a century or so. So, yes, it does appear that there was a melting underway when our putative comet strike occurred. So I would say yes to that. Right. I mean, that was, wasn't that initially like what in the mysteries of the Younger Dryas period before, you know, before the comet research group came out, the the mystery was that there seemed to be this slow, quote unquote, gradual recession from the, starting from the late glacial maximum going all the way up to the beginning of what was called the Younger Dryas. And the mystery is why did it suddenly go, why did the whole world suddenly get, or the whole Northern hemisphere suddenly get locked back into the cold again? Yes. Uh, so yeah, there, there was a melting back and then there was some violent, sudden change. And that's the idea of the, and then there was another melting episode at 11, yeah. six, right? So my interest is in exploring the possibility of kind of a tandem event, or maybe even a perfect storm where you might've had, uh, impacts, but also associated with solar activity. But would you just to follow up? I guess the the cycles that he was talking about that are, you know, just the glaciation, uh, the stades and interstades. Do uh, you think every one of those is would have some catastrophic end and beginning, or do you think that that, that could most likely due to the sun? Because that's what I was thinking. The sun's longer cycles may be responsible for the sort of gradualistic. Yes, stades and interstates. Yes. But what I'm actually trying to move towards here is the idea of a coherent theory that ties together the solar system as a whole, that includes yeah. not only the planetary bodies and their combined effects on the sun, but also the solar response to the infall of sun grazing Kreutz type comets, which are now uh, a, a factor that we're realizing is is probably a lot more important than anybody imagined a few decades ago. Um, and the idea of when we go outside the, the, the planets themselves, which is just the inner part of the solar system, now we're looking at this whole p- potential structure of, of primordial material that is linked as part of this system. And then that, in turn, is embedded in a much larger scale phenomena, a a galactic scale phenomena. And then we get into some other interesting things like the idea that there may be some type of uh, pulsation or periodicity that is galactic in nature. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's really interesting, important ideas to explore here and, and hopefully, you know, over the next six months to a year, we'll, we'll get to exploring a lot of those ideas. Yeah, the Kuiper, Kuiper Belt and Oort Cloud objects. Yes. Which may be affected by gravitational forces that have to do with something that's completely out of our solar system or maybe center of gravity or center of the galaxy stuff or possibly uh, orbits of other stars. It's lots of interesting stuff about that. Yeah, Paul La Le- Violette, I think is how you say his name. I've read his book. Um, he talks about galactic core explosions. Yeah. And I don't right. accept the idea at this point or reject it. I just have to think, you know, an idea like that, I have to really 
look at both sides. If there are critics, what are the critics saying? If he comes back, and just like you would through the scientific literature, somebody presents a peer-reviewed paper, then it gets attacked. People try to take it apart, and then the original authors come back, and they respond to the criticisms, and it might yeah. go back and forth for a while. And I usually refrain from making up my mind until I've tried to work my way through um, all the different perspectives on things. So, but I'm certainly holding it out as a possibility that needs to be explored further. And if it, if it bears out, we might be looking at something on a galactic level that might be, uh, say, uh, affecting the influx of cometary masses to the inner solar system. And yeah. that in turn may have a whole series of consequences. Yeah, because right. well, we were expecting that in the next six months to a year, you were going to have this figured out. Right. That's you're what you're just you're only going to be just then exploring it. <laughs> we were hoping for answers. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I mean, it's yeah. I, I, my plan was to have it figured out by next Monday. Oh, okay. <laughs> but, good. But if that doesn't work out, then Tuesday. <laughs> so. <laughs> but I agree. This like looking for cycles in astronomical. Uh, you know, events is is the way to go. And if you can learn cycles, mm -hmm. and then you see that there's all these different wheels, these all these different cycles, and when certain things converge, that's when stuff happens. And you can so then you can know, you can see way in the future, like twenty thousand years, if there's going to be some kind of galactic event that's going to push Oort cloud objects towards the center of the solar system, and twenty thousand years later, those things are going to be in the inner solar system, breaking up and impacting planets. You know, I mean, that's a long timeline, but it's good to know because if it's yeah. going to happen in 40,000 years, it happened 40,000 years ago, and they may be here right now. 